You're listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis, the only podcast focused on the biohealth capital region. Each episode, we'll talk to leaders in the industry to break down the biggest topics happening today in biohealth. Hi, this is Rich Bendis, your host of BioTalk, and we've got a twofer for you today. That means we have two leaders from the biohealth capital region who are going to talk about the biohealth capital region being ranked in the top three in talent. And as most of our listeners know, we set out a goal about six or seven years ago to be top three by 2023. This just happens to be 2023. And it's nice to see that this region is recognized in the top three in the CBRE report, which we're going to go into detail today. And I have with me Dan Grimes, the Senior Vice President, Life Sciences for CBRE, and Ian Anderson, who's the Senior Director, primarily focused on research for CBRE. And for those who don't know CBRE, it's the largest commercial real estate and investment firm in the world. Wow, that's a big thing. So we're going to hear more about that from Dan and Ian, and we're privileged to have these leaders, and they're going to talk a lot about the industry that we're in, life sciences and biohealth. So Dan and Ian, welcome to BioTalk. Thank you for having us. Excited to be here, Rich. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. And basically, what we do, rather than me reading your bios, we think it's much more educational for the listener for you to do a self-introduction because you'll get into the relevant things about each of you. So I'm going to start with Dan, who's the Senior VP Life Sciences for CBRE, Dan Grimes. Dan, why don't you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure. So first and foremost, I'm a native to the region, uh, born and raised in Montgomery County. So a lot of our life science product, as everyone knows, it's on the I-270 corridor. So it's really exciting to see you know, what's happening in you know, the area that I grew up. So I help lead our life science practice here in the Mid-Atlantic. Our team's focus is on real estate. So we help provide real estate solutions that ultimately in our mind is helping you know, the ecosystem here grow. We've got a multidiscipline business, but if you were to simplify it, I'd really put it in under two buckets, and that's we advise users and we advise real estate developers. So on the user side, we work with pharma and biotech companies and put it simply, we help them find space, whether that's lab, production, GMP facilities, repositories, cold storage, you name it. And then on the real estate developer side, our mission is really to ensure that when these users need space, we're delivering the type of environments and quality you know, space that allows them to execute on their mission. So that last part, I think, is really key. And I'm really excited to be here joined with my colleague, Ian Anderson, because his talent report that we're going to talk about today and a lot of the research that he has done over the last several years has really been integral in bringing new real estate development on the life sciences side to our region. Thank you for that intro, Dan. And now we're going to flip it to Ian Anderson. Senior Director, Market Research of CBRE. Ian, a little introduction, please. Yeah, sure. I am a commercial real estate researcher and commercial real estate economist for CBRE. So as a Senior Director of Research, one of my roles is overseeing our research in the life sciences space. So there's really two main things I do. One, I work with a team of researchers that are all around the country and many of our professionals leasing or sales professionals around the country. And we compile commercial real estate data on the life sciences space, usually in the, the largest metropolitan markets around the United States. So we obtain that data, we scrub that data, we analyze that data to make sure that our clients are best prepared to transact in the marketplace. So that's investors and developers, whether they should build or how much. It's large pharmaceutical or large and small pharmaceutical and biotech companies that we guide through the marketplace as to where they may want to locate or how they should transact, et cetera. So we use all that data. I help oversee that. And then the other part of my role is thought leadership into the life sciences industry. So the bigger picture trends, what's driving the industry, the funding, innovation trends. And part of that is focusing on trends in talent and employment around the country, which brings us to this report. Well, thank you for that. And by the way, I didn't ask either one of you, but how did you end up getting into this business, Ian? 
Well, I have a master's in city planning from Penn. So I have a general interest in the built environment and commercial real estate trends or even residential trends. So I've been doing this for probably close to 20 years. I used to work for a, a large investment, global investment manager, and I'd help focus on their research as to where they'd want to invest or develop around the world. And then I've been with CBRE for about nine years in several different roles, just studying commercial real estate markets and all the drivers behind that. So it's of interest to me. And I, I suppose yeah, my education background is well suited for it too. Yeah, I would imagine we're excited to hear about the knowledge that you put into this report. So we'll get into that in a little bit later. But Dan, I didn't ask you what drove you to get into this business before we talk about further introducing more details about CBRE. Sure. So I've been in commercial real estate for almost 10 years now, came by the way of the banking industry, worked for Bank of America on one of their trading desks in their Charlotte office for a handful of years. And, you know, what drove me really into the industry was kind of the intersection of the finance background that I had in the banking world and, you know, seeing projects actually come to life. So it's been really exciting, you know, to work on, you know, many of the largest developments here in the region, especially in the life science space, as our region has continued to grow over the last couple of years. And we'll talk about some of those developments that are in the works, and I think will be great additions to our marketplace. So being able to drive down 270 or drive you know across the city, and my wife hates it when I do this, but point out the different projects <laughs> and working on who owns what, who's located where is really impactful to be able to actually see your work come to life. Right. She likes to show you where she shops. You usually like to show her where you're going to earn some money so she can't shop, right? That's right. <laughs> so we heard a little bit about what CBRE does with users and developers, but let's talk a little bit more in depth about CBRE and everything it does nationally and internationally and how it became the largest commercial real estate and investment firm in the world, Dan. So I'll let you do a little more in-depth analysis and the details about CBRE. Yeah, sure. So I'll give you a couple quick stats, and then I actually want to focus on our life science practice within CBRE. But I think it's important to recognize where we sit within the larger company. So as Richard indicated, we're the largest commercial real estate firm in the world. We're number 135 on the Fortune 500. We've got 115,000 employees worldwide and do about $30 billion of revenue annually. So obviously, we're a part of this behemoth. But I think what's really interesting and unique about you know being a, within the umbrella of CBRE is the specialty groups within it and the expertise that comes with it. So within the firm, we've got a national life sciences platform. You know, Ian referenced at the onset of the discussion, the various people that he's working with in the different markets across the US. And what we essentially have created is a group of you know roughly 100 professionals that are specifically dedicated to this expertise and this industry in really all the top science hubs in the US and frankly, across the world. So just to give you a sense of you know, the activity within that group, over the last three years, we've done about 45 million square feet of leases. And we also manage about 370 million square feet of biopharma facilities. Here locally in the Mid-Atlantic, our life science team has been fortunate to work with you know, many of the top pharma and biotech companies here in the region. In fact, we've actually worked on about one out of every two you know, deals that were done in the market. And then on the development side, we've been successful in bringing nine new institutional real estate developers to this market who are going to actually deliver literally millions of square feet of lab and manufacturing product over the next several years. So I bring up all those stats not to beat our chest here, but what I think is really important about that is it demonstrates the depth and breadth of the exposure that you get with working for you know a company like CBRE. So this affords us you know, really unique insights and allows us to advise not only you know at the local level, but really from a national and global perspective. So the report that we're we're talking about today, the talent report is a perfect example of that. You know, here locally, we've been pounding the table about how this region excels in not only talent, but the cost advantages that we have. But having a report like this, that's completely objective, we did not pay in off, although some people think we did, that helps validate that with actual data has been really impactful and effective with us, you know, sending that message. That's great. And then when you look at the different regions around the country, and maybe this is for either one of you before we get into the report, 
we have really defined the region. Originally, it was 270 corridor, but we tried to explain to people it's not just about five miles on one stretch of highway, because really it's a regional ecosystem that has been developed within this region. And I think people are starting to recognize that it's not just this five miles in Montgomery County. So we educated some other people on that, but we look at Maryland, D.C. and Virginia as what we classify as the biohealth capital region. So how do you define this region geographically for the area you cover, Dan, and what is included within this region geographically in that report? So the answer is the same, and it's exactly what you described, Rich. So the way that we kind of think about the region is almost this triangle with NIH, Fort Detrick, and Johns Hopkins in Baltimore kind of serving as the anchors. But it's really, you know, that entirety of the D.C. metropolitan and that you know bleeds into Virginia as well and you know, even down to Richmond. OK, great. So there's a great deal of, that's analogous to what the way we've been referring to the biohealth capital region and the way that this report is structured. So that makes that there's some continuity to the data that comes out of this. And now I'm going to flip it to Ian. Let's and Dan did a basic introduction to CBRE. Let's talk a little bit about the evolution, the need for the report, whose idea was it, how it evolved, Ian, and sort of bring us up to date as to where we are over the last couple of years with this report. Yeah, there's three main reasons for the evolution of this report, really. The first is, is that, frankly, our clients are just demanding this and more people, more of our investor clients, developers, lenders, companies, just with the explosive growth of the last several years, they just continue to want more data, more analysis into this market. So it's interesting, Rich, like five, six years ago, there were still so many people I'd work with that either weren't interested or thought this was like some small niche to discuss. And just the way that has changed over the last, whatever, six, seven years, now I get global calls, calls from all over the world wanting to know about the U.S. life sciences industry, how to partake. So the first main reason is, is that our clients have clamored for it with the growth of the industry. The second reason for this report particularly is how important talent is to the innovation of this industry. And that's obviously different to many other industries. You really need that highly trained, highly educated, innovative workforce that is not exactly plentiful all around the country to drive innovation and new technologies and discoveries, et cetera. So that's the talent is so key for this industry in particular. And usually where that talent is, is going to be where this industry is going to continue to grow. And so that's particularly important, not for companies wanting to grow their workforce, but also, again, for developers or investors, et cetera, where they should position themselves. The third main reason for this report and why it's really so timely and it resonates with a lot of readers is that the labor market's so tight. People are having such a tough time trying to get talent. And so if we can help any of our clients gain an edge as to where to find this talent, or where they may want to expand operations or double down in whatever locations they're already in, that's just one extra piece of guidance they can use in this tough labor market. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that we've identified as well in just tracking the trends within the region is that really the talent drives the primary decision for why people are going to be relocating or setting up a shop in the U.S. or on a regional basis. And in the past, it was really what kind of incentives, tax incentives are you offering, how much capital is available, what kind of space is available, particularly now. But right now, there might be a lot of a space. If you, if you don't have the people to go into the space and do the work that needs to be performed, you're going to have a challenge. So, Ian, I think that your criteria fits exactly what we're seeing within the region and the greatest need and why potentially we rank as well as we do because historically, regardless of who does a report, a lot of them have been more generic than CBRE, which hasn't been as focused just on the talent side of it, which is extremely important. We always rank high in that category. So let's go into a little more detail related to the report. And you guys can play off of each other however you want to. But Ian, since you're the in charge of the research, we're going to lead with you. And there's a number of different things included in this report. And it's the 
U.S. Life Sciences Research Talent Report for 2023, produced by CBRE. And, you know, you get into geography, sources, salary trends, demographics, and all of these different areas related to talent. So let's go into those different categories and what's included in the analysis as you break these elements down, Ian. Sure. So the first thing probably to clarify is that this report is focused on life sciences researchers as opposed to all people employed in the life sciences industry. So these are going to be, generally speaking, your scientists or that support staff that are working in the wet laboratories, working on the innovation, the products for the industry. It's not going to include in our analysis some of that, some of the support or affiliated staff, like management, like sales, what have you. These are mainly people working in the labs, the scientists. So there's a couple of things we did with the report. One, we wanted to look broadly across the United States at how are these life science researchers growing? Who are they? Where are they growing fastest? And even in this report, we looked at some details we haven't in the past, but we wanted to look at salary trends. Inflation's rising is the same thing occurring for life sciences researchers and demographically. But you know, one of the bigger takeaways to the report is, as opposed to just looking broadly at the trends for life sciences researchers for the US was we use several criteria and we rank the largest 74 markets around the United States, metropolitan areas, according to a certain criteria that we felt was best for our clients to determine if they wanted to locate or expand in certain geographies rather than others, which really brings us to here, which was the Washington Baltimore region was ranked number three, according to that criteria in the report, which is obviously really good for the region. Yeah. And when we talk about researchers, are we talking industry exclusively, Ian, or do we include the researchers at Johns Hopkins University of Maryland, NIH, because we have such a strong presence in researchers that are non-industry, but complement industry and partner with industry in our region, which really makes a dynamic in the biohealth capital region a little different. Yeah, we don't identify them just by whether they work in the life sciences industry. We identify them by occupations. So there's probably a little bit of error there. There is a little bit of error there in the data, which we try and account for. But for example, we want to track how many data scientists are in the region. So that's one criteria we use to evaluate how many life sciences applicable workers there may be. And so clearly, you know, not all of those data scientists are working in life sciences, but we know that more and more of them are, and they're integral to the future of the industry. But otherwise, we focus on occupations like biological scientists, biochemists, biophysicists, no matter whether they work for Johns Hopkins the federal government or industry. So it's a real, what we really want to do for our clients was say, we wanted to put them in a pool, whether they're in life sciences right now, whether these people could transition easily from government or academia or what have you into the industry. Yeah, I think that's a fair way to look at it from a pool standpoint, because industry doesn't care where they come from as long as they have the expertise that's needed to fulfill the job requirements within that company. For example, they could come from NIH, they could come from a university, they could come from a, another research facility. So I, I think that's a very good assumption that you use within that report, Ian. So let's talk a little bit about some other things related to that. Salaries with COVID, I think, have gone up in the last couple of years. Talk a little bit about what trends you're seeing in compensation and salaries in the report. Well, we can tell you that from our what our clients have been telling us over the last couple of years, that it has probably been never been harder to obtain, retain, acquire talent around the country. It's just a difficult vetting process, recruitment process, et cetera. And that's reflective of unemployment rates as they're at their lowest levels in 50 years. So one, we know anecdotally from our clients, it's been excruciating. Salaries continue to grow higher. The data we uncovered specifically in the report shows that the salaries for these occupations have been growing at an above average rate, higher than the average rate for most private workers in the United States. 
and their highest levels in years. More so, we can tell by recent national data that there's not going to be any let up as far as we can see for the rest of 2023. They're going to continue to rise and go higher at above average rates. So it's not going to get any easier. But long story short, they're growing. They're going to grow higher in 2023. It's not going to be any easier. Another thing that you mentioned also was like the data scientist. And maybe Dan can talk a little bit about this, because really what we're seeing is the evolution of AI, machine learning, quantum, and all of these other technologies impacting the life science industry. And we really talk about it as convergence. That's why we came up with the name biohealth rather than biotech, because you're converging of that technology versus pharma, biomedical device, and then add in the dimension of AI, machine learning, and quantum. And Dan, what are you seeing as you talk to potential clients or existing clients right now is the need for the data scientist in the life science industry? Yeah, I mean, you're spot on. You know, there's certainly a significant amount of overlap. And you know, I think that's one of the reasons that this region has scored as highly as it has. You know, there's really two reasons. One is what you described previously in terms of just the sheer number of researchers and scientists that we have that sit on the public sector side that, you know, maybe fly a little bit under the radar, but there's certainly a huge cohort of groups that are working for NIH or FDA or at Hopkins, as you alluded to, which the private sector is now recognizing that they can tap into when they're looking for markets to grow. And then the second piece, you know, as you're talking about that overlap between technology and AI and data scientists, if you look at our region and our educational system and the you know, number of specialized graduates that we're pumping out on an annual basis, we score really well, really across all specialties, but especially when you look at biotechnology and that's where the data scientists come in. So with the University of Maryland, with Hopkins, with George Mason, Georgetown, George GW, you, know, you go down the list and this region you know, pumps out you know, some of the highest numbers of those specialty degrees, which means we have a pipeline of you know, employees that can ultimately fill those roles and help you know, facilitate that crossover between the science and you know, the technology. You know, it's funny, Rich, I'll, I'll just chime in there quickly too. It's interesting in our, in our research too, because we try and be very precise, limited, focused on just life sciences occupations or people employed in the life sciences industry. But more and more as I dig into the data, we try and we account for this in our, in our talent report, is that the most vibrant, thriving research clusters around the United States are continually most highly correlated, not with the number of biophysicists, but it's with more general data points, such as the number of PhDs, regardless of what degree you have it in. So that's one thing we did. We correlated all these markets with the number of PhDs in the region. We looked at the percentage of the labor force that's just in general professional, scientific, and technical services. Just those two indicators are about as well correlated with thriving life sciences ecosystems in the United States as any indicator we can find that's just particularly life sciences. So I think that's telling about what the industry needs, how smart people like to cluster with other smart people, and that some of the more precise life sciences we data needs to be enhanced with some of this data on data scientists or just general PhDs and so on and so forth. So let me talk a little bit that it might be off topic a little bit, but it's very important to our region. You know, the, the region has been known as a basic research region for a long time, but it's become much more commercial. So which means that people are actually producing things and selling things in the region now that have been researched. So, and one of the challenges I've heard, and maybe you can expound on this a little bit, Dan or Ian, is that from a manufacturing perspective, you might not need as many pure researchers, but you need manufacturing talent to go in to man the manufacturing facilities that are the result of what the research has produced. So how do you look at the analysis related to the manufacturing dynamic, Dan and Ian, and how we grow the workforce and needs for manufacturers since we've become more of a commercial region than just a research region? 
So the report that we've been talking about, as Ian mentioned, is specific to you know the research side of the equation. I will tell you that we have run similar labor analytics analysis, not quite to the extent of you know, the national level that Ian and his team had put together for our region, just to see how we stack up against you know, some of the other key life science clusters that are also running into, frankly, the same issues now that the science is advancing to a point of commercialization. And there's certainly a greater emphasis on having that close to where the actual science is being done are you know, starting to see where that product can be developed. So the net of that is the DC capital biohealth region scores very well in that regard, in terms of you know, having the demographics and existing workforce to support that type of job and you know, commercialization where we don't score as well is the reality of actually having that physical real estate to support it, which is something, you know, as I mentioned at the onset of the call that we're working to help you know, fill the void. And the other piece is in comparison to some other markets, you know, think RTP is the prime example. We don't have as robust of a training system for those type of employees as you're seeing in some of you know, the other clusters around the country. So I think that's one area, well, I know for a fact, you know, in conversations with the state and you know, local counties is an area that we are trying to address, but that's where you know, we have some work still to do. I'm a member of the Life Science Advisory Board that Dr. Jay Perman, the Chancellor University of Maryland, chairs. And over the last couple of years, that's been an area of focus. You know, when, when we talk about the talent, we also see the need both in manufacturing facilities as well as manufacturing employees that we need to have that training, whether it at the community le college level or at the higher ed level, working more closely with industry to understand what their needs are for the future. So I guess we're on point on that, Dan. So Ian, let's go back a little bit and talk about, you mentioned the largest 74 markets. You really look, you know, everybody sort of looks at the top 25, top 10. And you've been doing this report now. This is the second year, correct? I mean, it's not a long period of time to do comparative analysis, but are you seeing any shifts of people who are upcoming, coming up the ladder relatively quickly or anybody that are, are losing a little bit? And I'm not just talking about one slot going from one, you know, eight to nine or nine to 10 or something, but are you seeing emerging markets really rapidly growing or are some markets in decline? Well, we don't see those huge shifts maybe that you, you want to see, like somebody dropping from like four to 11 or something like that. We don't see any of that. The data is a little too lumpy. And as you can imagine, these occupations don't change that much or the graduates we're tracking in biological and biomedical sciences don't change that much year by year. Having said that, so I do, when I see a shift of like two places over the last year, I'm impressed. And they, they occurred in our report in places you might think. One is Philadelphia. Philadelphia has a lot of momentum. And so the number of occupations that have increased in that region, the amount of graduates that continue to increase coming out of there, that was one. There's also Sacramento is another one benefiting from the overflow and UC Davis, the Sacramento region. One that's a little surprising to me that shows up, not great, but it shows momentum and it's got a lot more graduates than I thought there would be is the Miami Fort Lauderdale region. And then you got some really kind of smaller ones that are up and coming. We continue to watch a place like Phoenix, but closer to home, Richmond's another market that we highlight with good momentum. It's not in our top 25, but it's got good momentum. And then also, though it's not a report, but I think it's important for the biohealth capital region, is Charlottesville's percolating too. So what I've said to some of my colleagues too, is that it's interesting to see in the mid-Atlantic region, you know, we could be in these early stages of what I'm continually seeing in New England too, with the Boston. So Boston's starting to see this little constellation of markets around at Boston, Cambridge. It's starting to see more momentum in Worcester, more in Providence. You see it more in Hartford and New Haven. And so it's starting to pop up. And so you can start to see it in the mid-Atlantic a little bit too. You know, outside of Baltimore, Washington, you see it, small things happening in Charlottesville, Richmond coming around too. So those are some emerging markets, maybe a little. Thank you for that perspective. And then, Dan, as we look at competition, you know, we're mostly concerned about who do we lose to in the biohealth capital region. Talk a little bit, you know, when you, you see the competitive analysis and 
people are looking for three or four sites and we're one of those sites somewhere in Maryland or Virginia, DC area. Who is it that we mostly compete against? We generally would think about Boston and San Francisco, but what are you seeing? Anything changing in that perspective? Yeah, I mean, Boston, San Francisco, San Diego are, you know, I think recognized unequivocally as you know, the top three life sciences markets. When it comes to competition, we typically don't compete all that often against the West Coast markets. So it's really Boston. And then you start to look at the Philadelphia's of the world, the RTPs of the world as you know, kind of the primary locations that if you were looking to you know expand or set up shop you're kind of looking in you know those markets that all have you know great connectivity between each of them so there's you know advantages of that as well so the fact that our market has scored as well as it has i think has surprised many and you know part of the reason again is you know a lot of our talent is a little bit hidden in the sense that it is working for the public sector but as you know groups are either getting priced out of some of these other you know top markets or just having such a difficult time competing for that pool of talent, our market has certainly become a you know, really attractive option. You know, it's one of only four markets across the entire country that has at least 30,000 scientists. So if you're an organization, you're looking at, you know, where can I go to scale? This is you know, one of the few that can actually support that in a meaningful way in a quick manner. And then the other key component too is you know, we were talking about salaries earlier. And while they certainly are rising across the board, that is across the board. So it's for everybody. And I think one of the interesting you know, statistics that came out of this report is it doesn't really matter where you are located. The average salary is roughly the same. So you could be in DC, you could be in Boston, you could be San Francisco, you could be in Houston. And for these jobs, you're getting paid roughly the same. So that's where the cost of living, you know, really becomes impactful if you're making the same amount, but your dollar goes a lot further in one location versus another, that becomes, you know, a key decision tool as these companies are looking at where they should go. And of the top five markets in this report, we have the lowest cost of living. So that's another reason that I think you'll see, you know, some activity getting drawn to this region. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy because the talent is so important and it's such a big component of the operating cost for any company that there you're looking at. A lot of people think it's a space, but generally, as you continue to grow in population of your base of employees, that becomes such a much higher percentage of your operating cost than what the lease or your facility cost is. But I would imagine when you put the cost of living with the cost per square foot of rental space or real estate in our region against San Francisco and New York and as a, and Boston as well. That's another dynamic that gives you an advantage when you're selling, Dan, right? You're spot on. It's a clear cost advantage versus those markets. When you start to compare it to a Philadelphia or an RTP, it's much more similar. In fact, you know, RTP is you know, slightly cheaper, both on the rental side and some of the incentives and taxes and you know, some other factors that go into your overall you know, operating cost. But that's when you then you know need to look at, okay, well, what's my overall talent pool look like? And you know, the fact that we have the size of talent pool that we do with that cost savings over some of those other markets is the combination that I think will help us win the day in a lot of cases. Yeah, there's been a little softening in the industry, as we all know, based on capital availability over the last year. Um, but you do have some nice projects that are emerging still within the region. So can you talk a little bit about some of the major existing projects that you guys have been involved in and some of the new things that are, are emerging that it's public information you could talk to the listeners about? Sure. Yeah, happy to. We've got some really you know exciting projects on the real estate side here in the pipeline. As you mentioned, Rich, it's a little bit of a choppy time in the capital markets right now, which will certainly have an impact on the delivery of those. But what I think is important is as our region grows, it's only going to grow, you know, if we have the product to support it. And I think one of the challenges for our region historically is we've been reactive to new demand versus having that product ready to go. And this is an industry where you want to occupy that space two weeks ago, right? And the other piece with that is our market has kind of grown on a one-off basis versus having some really exciting master plan developments like you see in some of the other top clusters around 
the country. So obviously Kendall Square looks a lot different than you know the Shady Grove market, but that doesn't mean that you know that's necessarily going to win the day all the time. So with that as a long-winded preface, we've got some really exciting, you know, master plan developments that are coming and I think will drive an ecosystem that's more akin to what you see across the country. Just to name a few, Pike and Rose, which I think you know, most folks are familiar with in terms of a really exciting mixed use environment that already exists today in North Bethesda. Federal Realty's got plans for about 500,000 square feet of trophy class A lab development. Their first phase, which is construction documents complete and you know, shovel ready and you know, could be kicked off almost immediately, will feature about 260,000 square feet. And it's going to be the first truly urban life science environment that we have here in the region. A couple others in Shady Grove, you know, which you know, really is the largest concentration of, you know, activity for the whole capital area. On the life science front, you've got Boston Properties, who's going to develop the Shady Grove Innovation District, which will have 1.1 million square feet at full development. And then you've got Trammell Crow on the old Bellward Farm site, who's going to develop another 1.5 million square feet. And those are going to be true, you know, master plan developments, not just, you know, one-off lab buildings, they're going to have, you know, amenities, they're going to have incubators, they're going to have, you know, some housing components that, you know, truly create more mixed use kind of environment that folks that are in the tech industry or life science industry or really any workforce is is looking for today. So really excited to have those type projects coming in the near future. Yeah, you mentioned, I think it's been one of the weaknesses. We have been reactive, didn't have a lot of spec space available if someone was looking and It's nice to see some new names coming into the region and some nice new spec space potentially that's going to evolve through these projects you're talking about, Dan. So let's talk a little bit about the future. Both of you can look into the crystal ball. And Ian, what do you see as you're an economist and a researcher? What are you seeing in the next two to five years here in the life science industry? And if you can even drill down into, we'll let Dan drill down into our region. You can give more of a little global perspective of what you're seeing. Yeah. Well, you brought up kind of the soft conditions of the industry, which is important too, because we don't want to overlook that. And I, you know, I spoke about how wages are going to and salaries are going to continue rising. It's still going to be a tight labor market. So that might surprise some really quickly on that. A couple of things, why we continue with that. And this gets back to your question about the future. A couple of things. One, we track the monthly numbers from the U.S. jobs report every month. And it's really interesting to see, Rich, that we continue to reach new records in the life sciences industry, even to this date, which is that's definitely slowed in terms of its pace. But we, the labor market is just continues to be surprisingly resilient across the country, but also for this industry. So though there are layoffs, it seems that the amount of people getting reemployed still seems to be pretty good. Having said that, we think it's going to soften here in the near term, along with a greater economy. But another takeaway from a report that makes us a little more optimistic, especially regarding the wet lab, is that when we looked at these life sciences researchers, the people who work in the lab, the number of those in the U.S. has not declined in over 20 years through three recessions. So even during the global financial crisis, not as relevant during COVID, but even after 2001 recession, the number of life sciences researchers has never dropped. So Long story short, I think when we look out to the future, Rich, is that we expect the labor market to soften, things still to be slow, but there's still going to be a surprising amount of tightness in this market. So it's going to soften a little bit more from here, but beyond that, in the next couple of years, we're still very optimistic that capital markets will heal, get back on their legs, and we're going to be back up and running shortly here. So from an investment perspective, it's a hold with strategic buys. Wow. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Okay. (laughs) Dan, let's talk a little bit more about the Biohall Capital Region. Ian's given us a perspective more nationally and globally what's happening. What is your prediction on the crystal ball about our region? Yeah, I mean, our region certainly isn't immune to those dynamics that are occurring at a national level and you know, some of the funding challenges, you know, not real estate related, related to just continuing to fund the science are certainly prevalent for companies that sit here locally as well. What keeps me optimistic, though, is the science keeps advancing. And I think you see that with the job numbers you know, that Ian alluded to. There's a reason that researchers has never declined, despite the fact that when we've gone through a handful of recessions during that time period. So that means that 
there's going to be you know continued advancements. Good science is going to continue to get funded. Groups are getting creative on you know how to do that in the near term. But as we you know come out of this and things stabilize, I think you're going to start to see a much more you know, traditional path of growth for a lot of these companies. And then at the end of the day, it goes back to a lot of the things that we've talked about during this conversation. As funding is tight, you're going to look to figure out ways to reduce your operating costs. So you're always going to need talent, but if there's an opportunity to reduce operating costs, you're going to take that. And I think our region offers a really compelling way to do that, which will be super beneficial in the near term. And then as we get additional you know, growth and companies to the market, you'll see them continue to grow as the industry kind of stabilizes and continues its path forward. Thank you. We've been speaking with Dan Grimes, Senior Vice President of Life Sciences for CBRE and Ian Anderson, Senior Director or research for CBRE as well. And I'm gonna give you guys last words. Is there anything that I didn't ask or we didn't discuss that either of you feel that the listeners would be interested in hearing from either of you? Rich, one final thing about it, about the report here, that I think it's important for the region too, and our policymakers and maybe some of your audience. So I think the one important thing for them to hear is that it's a pretty pivotal moment for the region to think about its future here. So we've obviously got a lot of sluggishness regarding the federal government, its outsized effect on the region. What our report shows, what some of the data is showing is that this region has the number three ranked talent in the country to grow this industry locally. It's got a huge anchor here. It's now time to really take a hard look and make sure we don't lose that anchor or we do everything we can to make sure that this industry, which has a very long-term bright outlook, to make sure it stays here and flourishes here because this is not something you want to lose. It's also something that every metropolitan area in the United States is chasing after very aggressively. And it's happening all over the region. Universities want to get so... Let's and we've got a gift here. The data shows it. It's time to take advantage of that, that edge we have. Right. Basically, don't take it for credit. But basically, at this particular point in time, try to protect it and grow it because we've got a base that other people will never ever have, really. With NIH and FDA, there's only going to be one NIH and one FDA in the United States, and they just happen to be both in our region. So, Dan, anything that you have for last words for our audience? I don't think there's anything I can add to that. And that's a message I've been, like I said, pounding the tables on trying to tell, but coming from somebody that sits in Philadelphia, like Ian, our competition, who runs a national report, like you can't say it better than that. So completely agree with everything that was just said. Super. Lastly, for the listeners, when we release this podcast, we'll also have a transcription to link them to that report. But if they have an interest in getting access to that report before this gets public, Ian, how can they get access to your U.S. Life Science Research and Talent Report for 2023? Yeah, I think if you just Google actually 2023 CBRE Life Sciences Talent Report, they could download that. If that doesn't work, Rich, you know what? You can give them my email. I'd be happy to help them and send it to them. If you'd like to give it to them, you can tell them now. Oh, all right. That's ian.anderson2 at cbre.com. So ian.anderson2 ubre.com. And it's Anderson with an O. Very good. And Dan, anything for the listeners before we close here? Feel free to reach out to me as well. Happy to help with anything I can. My email is dan.grimes, G-R-I-M-E-S at cbre.com. Great. Thank you very much. I want to thank Dan Grimes, Ian Anderson, both with CBRE for enlightening our listeners about the top talent we have in the biohealth capital region. One of the statistics that I wasn't aware of, which we're going to promote more, is that we're one of four regions in the United States that has over 30,000 research scientists in the life science industry. There's only four guys, and we are ranked number three. So keep up the good work. Thank you for your reporting, and we'll continue to follow your analysis. Ian and Dan, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for listening to Biotalk with Rich Bendis. 